Right, so, so first, uh, um, thank you very much for giving me the, the opportunity to, to give this talk and thank you very much for the wonderful organization. I mean, uh, well, I was a problem, I'm sorry about that, but in general, the techniques he, is working really smoothly and I must say uh, congratulations to, to the organizers. And I'm very happy to be here uh, in Poland, as I said already, it's my second time last time was uh, 29 years ago okay Poland has changed uh, all right so I will present you um, um, experiments that we've done in, in our group uh, in uh, Paris North uh, and it's um, related to what David uh, has presented in the sense that uh, it's uh, about superfluidity of quantum gases but I will concentrate on looking at uh, superfluidity uh, by its dynamics. So looking at uh, gases that move and in particular that rotate very fast. Okay, so I will be quick here because we had a, a very nice reminder about superfluidity by, by David already. Uh, what I want to, to stress uh, is that so quantum gases uh, are superfluid in the weak interaction regime. Uh, which um, has, uh, um, because of the, the absence of viscosity, one of the consequences is that uh, you can observe persistent currents when you put uh, the atoms in a circular geometry where they, uh, they can flow for, for a very long time, like in, in this uh, illustration. And uh, there is a critical velocity for the excitations uh, in the gas. And the critical velocity for a uniform gas from Landau's criterion uh, is uh, equal to the speed of sound in the gas. And uh, finally, uh, one other important property of superfluids is that uh, their, uh, have the, the velocity of the flow comes from the gradient of the phase and uh, they obey uh, hydrodynamic equations and the uh, circulation of the velocity anywhere inside the fluid is quantized in units of the Planck constant divided by the atomic mass. So usually what happens when you try to set a gas into rotation is that it develops lots of vortices, each of them having a unit circulation in terms of this quantity. Uh, so why quantum gases are interesting to study superfluidity, because you have other uh, systems uh, which are superfluid, that's because you can play with uh, the parameters of the gas. So I don't use here a, the change in interactions, however, uh, we use change in uh, geometry and confinement, so either harmonic traps, and in our case, you will see that we will play with uh, superfluids uh, that you put inside a bubble, so quite unusual geometry. All right, so this is the outline of my talk. I will first explain you how we make this bubble, and then I will give you some motivation on why we have started to look at rotation, fast rotation in this bubble, and I will uh, show you what happens when you rotate fast inside a bubble, and then give you some summary prospects. So how does this bubble work? Well, in fact, we rely on adiabatic potentials for radio frequency dressed atoms. So we had a, maybe two days ago, we, we had an explanation of uh, what is a, um, a dress state, and, uh, and um, I use dress state here uh, to produce potentials for the atoms. So the situation is, is the following. You have uh, atoms, which are, in, in my case, rubidium, which have a spin and which are placed in, in homogeneous magnetic field. Uh, which in my case is a quadrupolar field, spherical quadrupolar field. So essentially any direction you choose, uh, you have a constant magnetic gradient and the magnetic field increases linearly with the position. And so as the, I work with F equals to one state, there are three Zeeman states, uh, minus one, zero, plus one. And as a function of position, the energy of this Zeeman state, they increase uh, or decrease. And now if I place a radio frequency field with some frequency, uh, it will be resonant with the Zeeman splitting at some position in space, uh, because the magnetic field increases with position. So it's zero in the center and then it increases. So somewhere there will be a position where the Zeeman splitting is just equal to the RF photon energy. And so now if I look inside the dressed basis, I can take the energy 
uh, of a, the, uh, say, m equals minus one state, minus one photon, it has the same energy as a zero state with, uh, uh, let's say this one is with the n uh, minus one photon, this one with n photon, and this one with n plus one photon. So there is a degeneracy if you play by mixing the man energies and uh, the photon energy. This degeneracy is lifted if there is some coupling uh, between the uh, atomic spin and the radio frequency. And so this coupling, which is the radio frequency that I call omega RF, gives us the splitting at the avoided crossing between the dressed states. And so as uh, the um, Zaman energy depends on position, the dressed state energy also depends on position. And for this particular state, if we assume that at every position, the atoms stay in the local eigenstate, uh, this acts as a potential for the atoms, which is minimum right at the point where there is a resonance between the radio frequency field and the Zeeman splitting. So what are those points? I have a quadrupole field, zero in the center, increases linearly with position. So those points uh, draw a surface in space. And for a quadrupole field with a gradient which is twice as large in the vertical direction with respect to the horizontal directions, this surface of isomagnetic uh, uh, surface is given by an ellipsoid. So choosing the array frequency, I choose the radius of the ellipsoid where there is a resonance and where this very state is confined. So that's the way we uh, confine atoms uh, onto a surface. And so we can tune the radius of the bubble either by changing the gradient, which shrinks the ellipsoid if we increase the gradient, or changing the radio frequency, which inflates the bubble if we increase the frequency. Okay, so if I make a cut uh, inside this bubble and I am on Earth, uh, then there is little omega is the uh, frequency of the array frequency. And big omega is the coupling between the RF field and the atom. Okay, so with little omega, uh, this is the one which is adjusted between the two Zeman uh, levels. So because of gravity, the atoms, they gather at the bottom of this bubble. And you essentially have a pendulum now because you have a fixed distance between a point and the surface. So the atoms just oscillate like that at low frequency, proportional to square root of gravity acceleration divided by the radius of the, of the bubble. Whereas in the transverse direction, they are strongly confi confined to the surface by this avoided crossing. And the uh, frequency scales like the gradient of magnetic field divided by square root of the coupling. And you can uh, easily have a factor 10 to 100 between the horizontal and vertical frequency. And that's a, a nice way to prepare a two-dimensional quantum gas. And uh, in the past, we've done uh, lots of studies using that and uh, with uh, especially the, the eigen modes, the Bogolyubov modes of a two-dimensional quantum gas. And you can control nicely the in-plane geometry of your gas by playing with the polarization now of the array frequency because the coupling depends on the relative orientation of magnetic field and radio frequency field. It's a vectorial coupling. And so because of that, you can either have a deformed bubble with a main axis if you break rotational symmetry by choosing a linear polarization, uh, or have a very isotropic uh, confinement if you use a circular polarization which uh, respects the um, uh, rotational invariance. And of course, you can change dynamically this geometry. And for example, uh, this guy here is a trace of a scissors mode that you can excite by changing suddenly the orientation of the polarization from one axis to another one. And then the gas starts to oscillate between uh, uh, these two main axes. Uh, and uh, what I will not show today because I have a limited amount of time is a very recent uh, result we have obtained uh, with the setup where we have compensated for gravity. And in this case, uh, instead of filling the whole bubble where you, what you would expect naively, in fact, uh, the atoms gather on a circle because of the role of zero point energy, but this would be for another time. 
I will today mention the experiments we've done when rotating fast at the bottom of the bubble. So this is moderate rotation, this is fast rotation. So why rotation? The motivation is the analogy you have between a system of neutral atoms in a rotating frame and electrons in a magnetic field, uh, especially in the frame of um, quantum Hall effect. So if you have a two-dimensional harmonic trap in a rotating frame, this is the Hamiltonian you get in the rotating frame, which is modified by the rotation frequency times the angular momentum. And uh, the presence of uh, this term explains why you get vortices when you rotate. Uh, that's because vortices, of course, they cost some uh, kinetic energy, so they will increase this guy. But when uh, you rotate, they will uh, have a positive angular momentum, so they will lower this term. And with omega large enough, uh, it's better to have one vortex and then two, three, four, etc. Uh, so with zero um, rotation frequency, uh, a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator has uh, one ground state, two first excited states, three uh, second excited states, etc. And you can diagon diagonalize this Hamiltonian uh, in a um, uh, basis, which is also uh, an eigenstate of the angular momentum, because uh, this one is uh, rotationally invariant. And this is what is represented here, such that when I increase the uh, rotation frequency, uh, then uh, some of the levels they go down and uh, the other ones they go up so those ones they are shifted downwards because they have positive angular momentum and those ones they are shifted upwards because of their negative angular momentum and if you rotate right at the trapping frequency you come to the situation where you have a very uh, big degenerate ground state and this is what uh, is the, Lando, the lowest Lando level uh, celebrated in the quantum hole effect uh, ground state, um, context. Okay, but uh, here uh, you see immediately that uh, you face a slight problem because this is just at the rotating frequency. So now imagine you are not so precise and you are a bit larger, for example, so then this one will be lower, lower and lower in energy. And so you will favor a large a population of a higher angular momentum and it will be unstable. And this you can also see if you rewrite the Hamiltonian, so the same, same one, uh, using the expression of LZ and introducing a, uh, the analog of the uh, vector potential. Uh, which is just proportional to uh, this vector times the rotation frequency. So this is uh, the uh, interpreting the rotation as a gauge field. And this is exactly what you would like to study, charge particle in a magnetic field, but you have uh, still uh, this centrifugal potential, which will push the atoms outwards, and which is the guy that will cause you some problems if you rotate at the trapping frequency or larger. So uh, the right way to handle that is to use not a harmonic potential, but to use a quartic potential. So this was uh, proposed and realized uh, by Jean Dalibar and Eric Cornell more or less at the same time in these years, where this time you can rotate at the trapping frequency. It is flat here, but if there is some noise, that's not a problem because at large distances, the R to the fourth term will be there to prevent the atoms to fly away. So this is a experimental picture from this group just at omega r. But now that you have solved the problem, you can even play and rotate at larger speeds. And in this case, you have a anti-trapping in the center. So you expect to start to depopulate the density in the center. And in this picture, I don't know if you can see, but there are less atoms here. The density is a little bit less than there. So now the question is, is it possible to even fully deplete this region? And in fact, in theory, it has been studied this situation where you have a harmonic plus quartic potential in presence of large rotation, and you expect to see a kind of phase diagram like that, where at moderate rotation, you have a vortex lattice. Then when you rotate faster, you start to drill a hole in the center, uh, which they call a singly quantized array, because this is, uh, these are single vortices with hole, and if you rotate even faster, 
Uh, this is the giant vortex where you just have multiple quantization. All the circulation is there. All the vortices are inside in such a way. It's a way to, to say it. And uh, this uh, is even a situation where it is a one dimensional flow because there is no room even for a single vortex inside. It is so thin. So, uh, with our bubble, in fact, we have, of course, anharmonic potential because it's a pendulum. You know, it's anharmonic. So, let's try the experiment and rotate and see what happens. I told you that we can control the uh, uh, anisotropy of uh, the in plane anisotropy of our gas with the RF polarization. So, what we do is to distort uh, the, the gas by uh, going to linear polarization make a couple of uh, turns for uh, a fraction of second like about 0.2 seconds uh, distort strongly the gas it's a make it takes a kind of galaxy shape and then go back to rotationally invariant trap and see what happens and he, now you have a very slow dynamics these are seconds three seconds 15 20 24 seconds and you see that uh, there is uh, the gas takes the shape of a ring but if you look carefully i don't know if you see it on the pictures but there are still atoms in the center a little bit so we at this point we make a ramp uh, evaporation ramp so we force uh, further cooling and this accelerates the rotation and at the end of the day uh, we observe a very nice ring with nothing inside which lasts for like more than a minute. Uh, so um, this is uh, the same picture as uh, the previous uh, graph. And if you look uh, in a cut here, uh, you see that uh, the profile of this gas adopts a very nice Thomas Fermi profile and it's not compatible with, with a, if you, you assume it is a thermal cloud, it doesn't fit at all the, the data. So uh, now we may wonder, uh, it rotates, it rotates certainly fast, but what is the velocity? And this we can measure essentially in two ways, by knowing the potential and the centrifugal potential, and then in, from the radius here, you can go back to the uh, rotation frequency, or you perform a time of flight, the gas expands, and the square of the size increases linearly with the square of the time, and both uh, strategies give the same result. And we find that we rotate slightly above the uh, chopping frequency at the bottom. And the linear velocity, if you compute it by uh, just omega times r, gives you uh, 7.4 millimeters per second. Uh, you, may seem, uh, you may think that this is quite a small speed. But in fact, if you compare knowing the local density with the speed of sound, the speed of sound is only 0.4 millimeters per second. So the gas really flows at Mach 18. So it's extremely supersonic, but still it lasts for like one minute. Uh, so um, we, now we may wonder, uh, is this the uh, singly charged vortices with a hole in the center or this a giant vortex? And as we cannot really image the vortex, the vortices in, in the gas, we made numerical simulations uh, of our situation. And we find that we are uh, in this situation where we have still vortices in the bulk, but more vortices, more circulation here than uh, in between those two. So in a sense, most of the vortices are inside. So it's a big step towards the observation of the giant vortex, even though it's uh, still not there. OK, so I come to my conclusion. Uh, I have shown you that with these adiabatic potentials, we can build a very smooth, uh, very uh, unharmonic un uh, trap in which you can make lots of uh, superfluid dynamics experiments. We have observed a very long dynamical ring for a, about one minute flowing uh, with a rotation velocity larger than the chopping frequency and like 18 times the speed of sound. Uh, to observe di a giant vortex, we should reduce uh, significantly the number of atoms. So this is a simulation for 400 atoms. Uh, even if we do that, we don't have for the moment uh, the detection sensitive enough to, to detect it. And so uh, in the outlook, uh, we would like to look at uh, this uh, 
um, very supersonic uh, fluids, how it behaves if we uh, put an obstacle in the floor and what are its elementary excitations. And uh, I just flashed this picture where we have observed the first uh, quadrupole excitation of the of this uh, superfluid uh, of this um, dynamical ring. And these are the people who have uh, contributed to these works. And I want to acknowledge especially Yan Yang Guo, who was a PhD student on this experiment, and uh, Romain Dubessy and uh, Laurent Lanchambon, who uh, were the um, PIs who have uh, also supervised this uh, thesis. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. For, for a moment, you might see the message from Maciej Klevenstein, beautiful, that <laughs> what he wrote. So, uh, Thanks, now it's Maciej. time for questions. So, yes, we have, and, and then Tomek. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ellen. Very beautiful. Can you introduce a weak link and build something that, which would be the equivalent of a squid? Okay, so uh, in this experiment, we are quite far from the squid regime. We also have done experiments uh, such as, uh, you know, when I uh, presented the superfluidity, there was a ring picture. Yes. So here it was a, a ring trap with uh -huh. atoms at rest and where you can prepare a circulation like one, two, three, etc. Uh -huh. And uh, for the same reason that we don't have the resolution to observe vertices, uh, having a weak link needs a very uh, narrow res resolution uh -huh. that we don't have. But these experiments uh, have been done, in particular in the group of uh, Christian Campbell uh -huh. um, uh, at uh, uh, NIST and, um, and uh, Washington. Uh, uh, and uh, and saying yes, you you can see, for example, the uh, the current increasing by steps, and there are also nice experiments by your neighbor behind. <laughs> it's fabulous. Okay, Tomek. I would like to ask uh, the following question: Is it possible to perform the same experiment but uh, in non-symmetric trap? So when the excitation in X and Y is different, the the frequency and x and y is different and then you have non-symmetric trap rotating around the uh, z-axis or go even farther and uh, consider three-dimensional non-symmetric harmonic trap rotating along some tilted uh, axis okay so here um, the fact that the, the trap is isotropic is extremely critical uh, we worked very hard to have an isotropic trap. If you do not work uh, properly enough, if you have any very small anisotropy, then you can forget about your minute lifetime. It dumps uh, very quickly. Uh, so it is critical to have it uh, because, because you, we don't rotate anymore. I mean, we excite and then we let the gas as it is. Uh, you can, if, if you continue rotating uh, with the anisotropic trap, which we have at the beginning to excite, then you will communicate more and more excitation, and at some point you will uh, have the gas uh, flow away. And there were experiments in anisotropic traps uh, recently in the group of uh, Martin Sverlein, uh, where then they, they see uh, if you rotate, you have omega x different from omega y, for example, omega x smaller, and you rotate at frequency omega x. Then you have a no trap along one direction and a trap in the transverse direction. And so this has been studied uh, theoretically by uh, Joral Shepnikov, and there was uh, this experiment in the group of Martin Zwerlein. And so you have uh, vortices inside a band of fluid, and then depending on the conditions, you can try to have just one. And so that's, a, that's also possible. Okay, we have a lot of questions giacomo so and then very very nice i have a question just if you can comment about to, uh, what happened you were mentioned that you want to put an obstacle now okay we discussed before but i have a curiosity what there are some expectations i mean about what of course naively one should expect some heavy vortices, but in this case there is yeah well um there are several answers. So naively, you, you would expect, what I, what I know is that if it is slightly anisotropic, it is damped. So I expect that if we put some obst obstacle, it will be damped depending on the strength of this obstacle, etc. What motivates us in this direction is that if you have uh, a, 
uh, laminar flow uh, of uh, superfluid, then, um, in fact, uh, having an obstacle uh, with relative velocity close to the speed of sound is the most efficient way to create excitations. And so if you are too fast, at some point, you don't do anything anymore. So that's why, uh, as we are so fast, it's not clear to me uh, if really it would be as fast as if we have a relative velocity close to the speed of sound. So the idea would be to, to change the relative velocity between the atomic flow and the obstacle and to see where you are and more efficient to damp. But here it's not completely the same because you know there are, uh, we expect that the flow is full of vortices and it's um, more or less it's a, a solid rotation at some point. So in this situation, I don't know what happens. Okay, thank you. Let us thank Galen once more for great lecture.